Hello everyone, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Switch Bitch by Roald Dahl. Now, as you can tell from the title, uh, this isn't children's fiction as a lot of Dahl's work is. Just shift along there for you slightly. So this was actually, all the stories in this were originally published in Playboy, I think it was. In fact, I know it was because I looked at it. <laughs> so I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then give you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So... Four stories of seduction and suspense from the pen of the master magician, each with a wicked sting in the tail. The Visitor and Bitch are extracts from the diaries of the notorious Oswald Hendricks Cornelius, hedonist beyond compare. Uncle Oswald's exploits are as extraordinary as they are scandalous, as these two tales of sex and intrigue confirm in vivid and hilarious detail. The delicious thrill of sexual expectation and its sometimes maddening effect are explored in the great switcheroo and the last act. Here, the power of desire is a double-edged sword, both pleasurable and potentially catastrophic. Lust, triumph, the galling deflation of defeat. Roald Dahl captures them all in this superb... Roald Dahl captures them all in these superbly taught black comedies of human weakness and unexpected reversal. So, the first story in this is The Visitor. So he's talking about Oswald's diaries here. If it were regarded solely as a chronicle of a man's amorous adventures, then with a doubt, a doubt, then without a doubt there was nothing to touch it. Casanova's memoirs read like a parish magazine in comparison, and the famous lover himself, besides Oswald, beside Oswald, appears positively under sex. There was social dynamite on every page. Oswald was right about that. But he was surely wrong in thinking that the explosions would all come from the women. What about their husbands, the humiliated cock sparrows, the cuckolds? The cuckold, when aroused, is a very fierce bird indeed, and there would be thousands upon thousands of them rising up out of the bushes if the Cornelius Diaries, unabridged, saw the light of day while they were still alive. Publication, therefore, was right out of the question. Publish and be damned, as I believe Lord Byron said. We do get some pretty dodgy bits, such as this bit here. Um, it's talking about Egypt. Uh, I didn't like the country at all. Come to think of it, I never had. The place made me feel uncomfortable in my skin. It was the dirtiness of it all, I think, and the putrid smells. But then, let us face it, it really is a squalid country, and I have a powerful suspicion, though I hate to say it, that the Egyptians washed themselves less thoroughly than any other peoples in the world, with the possible exception of the Mongolians. Jesus. However, I'm not sure whether that's what Dahl thinks, or whether he's just trying to make an unlikable character, you know? Uh, and he is definitely written to be unlikable. I mean, I'm going to read these, these few bits here. Uh, I was no part of it. I was completely isolated in my own luxurious little shell, as snug as a hermit crab and travelling a lot faster. Out. Ugh. Oh, how I do love to be on the move, winging away to new people and new places and leaving the old ones far behind. Nothing in the world exhilarates me more than that. And how I despise the average citizen, who settles himself down upon one tiny spot of land with one asinine woman, to breed and stew and rot in that condition unto his life's end. And always with the same woman. I cannot believe that any man in his senses would put up with just one female day after day and year after year. Some of them, of course, don't, but millions pretend they do. I myself have never, absolutely never, permitted an intimate relationship to last for more than 12 hours. That is the farthest limit. Even eight hours is stretching it a bit, to my mind. Look what happened, for example, with Isabella. While we were upon the summit of the pyramid, she was a lady of scintillating parts, as pliant and playful as a puppy, and had I left her there to the mercy of those three Arab thugs and slipped down on my own, all would have been well. But I foolishly stood by her and helped her to descend, and as a result the lovely lady turned into a vulgar street and as a result the lovely lady turned into a vulgar screeching trollop, disgusting to behold. What a world we live in. One gets no thanks these days for being chivalrous. I mean what a world we live in, to be fair. And then we have this bit, which just seems nuts to me that this is what people do. Okay, I caught the killing box and the net on the ground beside me. Then with my little trowel, I began very cautiously to scrape away the sand all around the hole. This was an operation that never failed to excite me. It was like a treasure hunt. A treasure hunt with just the right amount of danger accompanying it to stir the blood. I could feel my heart beating away in my chest as I probed deeper and deeper into the sand. And suddenly, there she was. Oh my heavens, what a whopper! A gigantic female scorpion, not Epistothalmus, as I saw immediately, but Pandanus. How did I, I... I cocked up the easier one to say there. But Pandanus, the other large African burrower, and clinging to her back, this was too good to be true, swarming all over her were one, two, three, four, five, a total of fourteen tiny babies. The mother was six inches long at least. Her children were the size of small revolver bullets. She had seen me now, the first human she had ever seen in her life and her pincers were wide open. Her tail was curled high up, her tail was curled high over her back like a question mark ready to strike. 
I took up the net and slid it swiftly underneath her and, sc and scooped her up. She twisted and squirmed, striking wildly in all directions with the end of her tail. I saw a, I saw a single large drop of venom fall through the mesh into the sand. Quickly, I transferred her, together with the offspring, to the killing box and closed the lid. Then I fetched the ether from the car and poured it through the little gauze hole in the top of the box until the pad inside was well soaked. How splendid she would look in my collection. The babies would, of course, fall away from her as they died, but I would stick them on again with glue in more or less their correct positions. And then I would be the proud possessor of a huge female pandanus with her own 14 offspring on her back. I was extremely pleased. I lifted the killing box. I could feel her thrash thrashing about furiously inside and placed it in the boot together with the net and trowel. Then I returned to my seat in the car, lit a cigarette and drove on. I mean, to me, that's just cruel. But I guess it was fun. And uh, his car breaks down and then he sees someone coming along the road and it's a Rolls Royce we have here. I felt absurdly elated. Had it been a Ford or a Morris, I would have been pleased enough, but I would not have been elated. The fact that it was a Rolls, a Bentley would have done equally well, or an Asata or another Lagonda, was a virtual guarantee that I would receive all the assistance I required. For whether you know it or not, there is a powerful brotherhood existing among people who own very costly automobiles. They respect one another automatically, and the reason they respect one another is simply that wealth respects wealth. In point of fact, there is nobody in the world that a very wealthy person respects more than another very wealthy person, and because of this, they naturally seek each other out wherever they go. Recognition signals of many kinds are used among them. With the female, the wearing of massive jewels is perhaps the most common, but the costly automobile is also much favoured and is used by both sexes. It is a travelling placard, a public declaration of affluence, and as such, it is also a card of membership to that excellent and official society, the Very Wealthy People's Union. I am a member myself of long standing, and I'm delighted to be one. When I meet another member, as I was about to do now, I feel an immediate rapport. I respect him. We speak the same language. He is one of us. I had good reason, therefore, to be elated. We get this bit here. I know all about men, Mr Cornelius. I know how they behave. It is true, of course, that I am not the only father who has had this problem, but the others seem somehow able to face it and accept it. They let their daughters go. They just turn them out of the house and look the other way. I cannot do that. I simply cannot bring myself to do it. I refuse to allow her to be mauled by every Ahmed, Ali and Hamil that comes along. And that, you see, is the other reason why I live in the desert, to protect my lovely child for a few more years from the wild beasts. But unfortunately, the main character is basically a sexaholic, so... Bummer. And we get this, the, sm the smell of this guy's wife, he fancies the wife. He says, There was upon that hand of hers a diabolical perfume. It was almost exclusively animal. The subtle, sexy secretions of the sperm whale, the male musk deer, and the beaver were all there, pungent and obscene beyond words. They dominated the blend completely, and only faint tracks of the clean vegetable oils, lemon, kajapa, and zaroli, were allowed to come through. It was superb. Mate, she smells like whale, deer, and beaver. So here we get what a pair they were. The older woman had that slight forward hunch to her shoulders, which one sees only in the most passionate and practised of females. For, for in the same way as a horsey woman will become bandy-legged from sitting constantly upon a horse, so a woman of great passion will develop a curious roundness of the shoulders from continually embracing men. It is an occupational deformity and the noblest of them all. We get this very odd bit as well. There are three breeds of husband with whom one must never take unnecessary risks. The Bulgarian, the Greek and the Syrian. None of them for some reason resent you flirting quite openly with his wife. But he will kill you at once if he catches you getting into her bed. And then we have the little twist at the end, uh, which I don't want to reveal. But, yeah. So in the great switcheroo, we get this, these two husbands who plan to swap wives, but without their wives knowing, like they're going to pretend to be each other. And, um... He says, you mean faces? Uh, no, what about some of the differences? You mean faces, I said. No one's going to see faces in the dark. I'm not talking about faces, Jerry said. What are you talking about then? I'm talking about their cocks, Jerry said. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And you're not going to tell me... Oh, yes, I am, I said. Just as long as both men were either circumcised or uncircumcised, then there was really no problem. Are you seriously suggesting that all men have the same size and cocks, Jerry said? Because they don't. I know they don't, I said. Some are enormous, Jerry said, and some are titchy. There are always exceptions, I told him, but you'd be surprised at the number of men whose measurements are virtually the same, give or take a centimetre. According to my friend, 90% are normal, only 10% are notably large or small. So yeah, they hatch up this unnecessarily complicated plan, and they're practising going around each other's houses in the dark and stuff, and they know not to speak. 
it goes, as I fingered my way up the stairs, I found myself thinking of the burglars who had broken into our front room last winter and stolen the television set. When the police came next morning, I pointed out to them an enormous turd lying in the snow outside the garage. They nearly always do that, one of the cops told me. They can't help it, they're scared. So we get this conversation here. You ought to change over. Why? Gin is not good for females. It's not. It's very bad for them. I'm sure it's just as bad for males, she said. Actually, no, it isn't nearly so bad for males as it is for females. Why is it bad for females? It just is, he said. It's the way they're built. He's supposed to be a doctor as well, and then he complains that she doesn't listen to the advice of her doctor. And it's like, well, because that was the advice you gave her. It was terrible advice. He also tells her that menthol is a well-known aphrodisiac. Uh, and she smokes menthol, uh, sorry, anti-aphrodisiac. And she smokes menthol, menthol filters. And then she says to him, Oh darling, how marvellous, you got that famous thing. A real thick clump of hair growing out of each of your ears. You know what that means, don't you? It's the absolutely positive sign of enormous virility. So Biggie has hair growing out of both of his ears. So that must mean that my cat is extremely virile. Speaking of which, did you hear me talking about your virility, Biggie? Did you? Is that what you heard? Yes. So this is uh, near the start of Bitch, one of Uncle Oswald's diary entries, uh, and he's talking about Susie, and I just thought that was kind of funny, because I'm seeing Susie, Susie is my girlfriend. Although I don't think this was his girlfriend, I think this was just some random person. He also talks about cannabis. Uh, okay, Paris, Wednesday, breakfast at 10. I tried the honey. It was delivered yesterday in an early Sevres Sucre, which had that lovely canary... I tried to say canary like a Frenchman, which had that lovely canary coloured ground known as jonquil. From Susie, the note said, and thank you. It is nice to be appreciated. And the honey was interesting. Susie Jolly Boys. <laughs> oh, I hadn't picked up on that name before. Susie Jolly Boys had, I mean, it's spelled J-O-L-I-B-O-I-S. I guess in, in French, so it'd be uh, Susie Jolly Bois. So Susie Jolibois had, among other things, a small farm south of Casablanca and was fond of bees. Her hives were set in the midst of a plantation of cannabis indica, and the bees drew their nectar exclusively from this source. They lived, those bees, in a state of perpetual euphoria and were disinclined to work. The honey was therefore very scarce. I spread a third piece of toast. The stuff was almost black. It had a pungent aroma. The telephone rang. I put the receiver to my ear and waited. I never speak first when called. After all, I'm not phoning them, they're phoning me. So, uh, and then we, it, the story of bitch, basically they invent a perfume that like, makes men like instantly ravish women. It's a bit rapey to be honest. Um, but yeah, th they say it's because there's like an extra sense of smell that's laying dormant and this guy's figured out how to activate it. And he says, um, so here we go. But not, but not at all, but tell me, does that mean that an actual physical change has taken place in man's smelling apparatus? Absolutely not, he said. Otherwise, there'd be nothing we could do about it. The little mechanism that enabled our ancestors to smell those subtle odours is still there. I happen to know it is. Listen, you've seen how some people can make their ears move a tiny bit. I could do it myself, I said, doing it. You see, he said, the ear, mus the ear moving muscle is still there. It's a leftover from the time when man used to be able to cock his ears forward for better hearing like a dog. He lost that ability over 100,000 years ago, but the muscle remains. And the same applies to our smelling apparatus. Which I think is quite an interesting idea. I don't know if that's scientifically true, but cool. So yeah, overall, rating time. I did enjoy Switch, bitch. I'd probably give it a 4 out of 5. There are some, like, bits that would be, like, troubling and concerning. Uh, and, like, uh, not necessarily trigger warning-y, but just quite politically incorrect in here. Basically because of the time it was. And it was already, like, quite controversial stuff, I can imagine, when it was first published. Um, but yeah, if you want some sex stories by one of the world's greatest ever children's authors, Switch Bitch by Roald Dahl. And the name's clever because Switch Bitch, you've got the story Bitch, and the bitch is the name of the perfume. And then we've got the great switcheroo, so that's where you get Switch Bitch from. So there we have it, that's what I made of Switch Bitch by Roald Dahl. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.